Next to East Africa, to Nairobi, and the front line in one of the world's longest running wars. This helicopter's mission is against a tiny universal enemy, one that's constantly threatened man since before the birth of civilization, insects. This campaign could be against any one of a dozen flies, bugs or beetles which attack timber. But the story is the same in maize fields, coffee plantations and stockyards all over the world. Everywhere, the bugs are on the march and man seems hardly able to fight back. This is Isipe, a research centre in Nairobi, funded by 30 nations and agencies to look into the physiology and ecology of just a microscopic sample of the world's five million species of insects. Isipe's director, Professor Tom Odiambo, explained man's relations with them. We asked if we were actually losing the battle against insects. Well, I think we could say it, it is bad because in many ways, uh, we have now much higher standards of what we expect of our ag agricultural produce or animal produce and so necessarily the effect of uh, insects on either plant diseases or animal diseases are quite serious. And secondly, over the last 15 years we have uh, been met with horrendous stories about the damage of insects in spite of the discoveries during the war and after the war of new insecticides for control of insects. In fact, as far as Africa is concerned, over the last 150 years, we have been able only to, to control to uh, a significant extent three insect pests. That is in 150 years. So it looks as if really we have not advanced very far in, in trying to solve insect and vector problems. Isipe's past successes include finding natural methods of combating the cotton leaf hopper, the mealy bug, and the maize leaf hopper. Of course, not all the insects in the world are harmful to man. Some are valuable friends. But among those which aren't are the setse fly, the brown tick, and the termite, three now under special study at Isipe. The approach here is not to develop pesticides. There are now considered too many drawbacks to those. Rather to learn as much as possible about each insect and exploit its natural weaknesses. That means studying the behavior and habits of each insect, its way of life, its anatomy, its chemical makeup and dependencies. That detective work should expose an area of vulnerability, a way to attack and beat the insect without risking the environmental damage that artificial insecticides often cause. One avenue of research concerns the common brown ear tick. The ticks are unpleasant enough, but themselves they're pretty harmless. The danger lies in their role as carriers of disease, usually the notorious East Coast disease, which wreaks havoc with cattle in East Africa. East Coast disease, borne by ticks, has been around long enough for some breeds to have developed an immunity. And if a tick passes it onto a calf that's less than a year old, that has a chance to survive. But in improved cattle breeds, the inherent resistance is too low. Obviously, a method of controlling the ticks must be found if East Africa is to be able to improve its herds. And only by studying ticks and their function as carriers can it be evolved. This is where Isipe comes in. A field experiment shows how cattle become infected. Ticks in the grass wait for a victim or host to pass by. Alerted by the calf's body heat and breath, it prepares to attach itself. The tick needs a body from which to feed and replenish its water supply. Once aboard the host, it gorges itself then falls to the ground to lay its eggs and repeat the cycle. In this way, the tick may pass East Coast fever to the calf in the biting process. It takes only one infectious bite to kill. To study the process under experimental conditions, Isipe has prepared a virulent population of ticks infected with East Coast disease and introduced them to paddocks of cattle. Each paddock is isolated by a double wire fence and a border of ploughed ground. 
Meanwhile, strict precautions are taken to mark the paddocks and the host cattle and to keep out unauthorised visitors. The ticks are left to do their worst, but not until the cattle have been vaccinated by a variety of different methods. Once a week, the cattle are taken from their grazing for examination. Institute staff note the animal's general health and monitor its resistance to East Coast disease. The field experiment is a way of simulating the circumstances in which the disease would be contracted in the wild and of testing the effectiveness of a real-life emergency vaccination campaign. Isipe scientists say they've already recorded valuable data, but there's still much to be collected. Blood samples can be analysed for a guide to how rapidly different vaccines attack the East Coast infection. Another aspect of the field experiment involves the collection of ticks from host cattle. Each of the paddocks is infested with ticks at varying levels of density. Some have a large number of ticks and a small number of cattle per acre, others vice versa. The plan is to gauge how quickly the ticks take advantage of the presence of a host cow. Isipe scientists know, for instance, that some ticks may have to wait for as long as a year for a host to come along. Then it must take advantage of the host to replenish the water its body has lost to the outside world, or it will die. It also needs to gorge itself before it can leave the host to lay its eggs and complete its reproductive cycle. Examinations like this are gradually building up the picture and giving the Institute the inside intelligence it needs to fight the ticks on equal terms. These insignificant looking pupae will grow into one of the most dreaded disease carriers in Africa. They'll become setse flies, bearers of the terrible sleeping sickness which afflicts at least 10,000 people a year and decimates herds of native cattle. For decades, doctors have been battling against the disease itself, while scientists have been all but powerless in their efforts to find either a pesticide to eliminate the flies or a drug to treat the illness. Setse flies have gone almost unhindered about their terrible blood-sucking business injecting their poison into the brain and nervous system of their victim and casting a shadow over 35 million people across Central Africa. While some research teams are gradually making progress in discovering how the Setse disease repels the counterattacks of human antibodies, Isipe's approach is mainly directed at the fly itself and at its ecology. The flies, contained in cages or ear boxes, harbour the parasite trypanosome. When this is transferred by a bite, it infects the victim. In natural conditions, that might be an African herdsman who may brush the fly away with hardly a thought, only to feel the first symptoms months later, before falling into a coma, probably to die. Here, only a rabbit is sacrificed. Such experiments have shown that the trypanosome is ineffective in the fly's digestive canal, but it becomes active on reaching its salivary gland. It's a clue which could prove to be one of those areas of vulnerability which have led to success at Isipe in the past. With all the benefits of modern science, why isn't it possible to develop safe, effective and cheap insecticides? I feel, for, I feel that is so for two main reasons. One is the very high potential um, that the, of the genetic makeup of the insect itself. 
and secondly, the very rapid life cycle. These two factors have meant that the insect has the facility to develop fairly rapidly uh, uh, resistance uh, towards any insect. Unfortunately for us, our strategy has been to kill insects completely, to eradicate insect species. Unfortunately for us, the, the insect is able to overcome this in a matter of ge a few generations. And uh, so if we, we are to develop methods, insecticidal methods, that would be of, of uh, benefit towards insect control over a longer period, what that would mean is that we have to change our strategy to be able to assume that only a proportion of the insects will be killed and that a small proportion will still li will live with us. In other words, we have to develop a strategy of coexistence. Now, so far, nobody has come out with this policy as a legitimate policy for per per pursuance by the scientists. But if this was done, then the possibility are there. I think this is one reason why this center and others are beginning to feel that they should look at other mechanisms for insect control. Here in Nairobi, your center is using a biological approach to insect control. Do you think all insects have natural points of weaknesses that could be exploited if only they were known? So far, we have not come across any major insect pest or vector which could not have a weak point. So, um, although I cannot answer you positively, I can ask you, I can answer you in the negative way, in sense in that so far we, we do know that any of the major pests have a weak point in attack. Now in the case of sese, which as you know is important for both human and livestock tipness masses and indeed is the major constraint in increasing production uh, in the animal field in large parts of Africa. Perhaps one of the major breakthroughs we've had recently is the fact that uh, we don't know the factors that control abortion. We feel uh, the question of abortion in sese could be a, a new avenue for control because sese only produces something like up to nine young in, his, in her whole lifetime. In other words, the populations we're dealing with are not very large. If we could um, increase the uh, rapidity and frequency of abortion, the possibility of, of controlling this uh, species uh, is quite high. Not that we will wipe them out, but we will control them to a, to a level where perhaps they will not be doing as much damage as they are doing now. And I can describe others in other fields where we have made fairly significant results. Even so, 30% of food production in the tropics is lost to pests and Kenya itself, through insects alone, loses a disastrous 75%. Near an Asipe field station outside Nairobi, the subjects for attention are the characteristic mounds seen throughout the bush, the strange nests built by millions of so-called white ants or termites. Asipe scientists are investigating how and why the mounds are made. It's a fascinating scientific puzzle. Since the mounds are such intricate pieces of engineering, with myriad tunnels and cells built for specific purposes, who is the architect of the mound? Isipe has proved that there is no master engineer, nor is it merely instinct which dictates the plan of the termite hill, but a remarkable chemical environment created by its millions of inhabitants, workers, soldiers, kings and queen. Analyses of termite mounds have shown that while the building work by individuals appears haphazard, there's real organization behind the creative effort. Researchers have found that the ants lay down a chemical route which they can follow. The queen of the nest also emits a chemical signal which alerts workers and tells them that there is building to be done in a certain area of the mound food to be sought, or a gallery to be excavated. Five or six such chemical messages are used within the holes to prompt calculated actions among the inmates. This was a nest of about two and a half million termites, which we have completely extracted and measured the population. Now we've dug a big trench around it, and we're measuring these holes, which are the passages through which the termites go out to collect their food.
A typical termite area might bear 60 kilos of termites per hectare. By weight, as much termite life below the earth as animals living above it. Since, in some parts of Africa, termites are viewed not only as pests, but also as a source of food, they're well worth looking into. This is an artificial gallery showing how the termites follow chemical scents in search of grass and fungus to eat, and soil particles for use as a building material. The ants are virtually blind. Their only guide and motivation is the highly volatile chemical hanging in the air around them. That and their single-minded dedication to the queen. Almost all the termite's actions are dictated by its duty to the queen. A three and a half inch egg laying machine which produces them at the rate of three a second, over a hundred million a year for up to 15 years. For the queen, the termites build a cozy home. Inside the mound, it's always 30 degrees centigrade with a constant humidity between 80 and 90 percent. Too hot, then the termites will open the nest to allow some of the warm air out. If it's too dry, they'll move the queen, like this, to a lower, wetter part of the mound. It's a perfect way of controlling the queen's environment. After all, termites have had over a hundred million years to practice how it's done. Entomologists now know that the biggest factor affecting the behavior of insects is a chemical one. Insects give off and respond to compounds called pheromones. This dissection is to find the gland which secretes a pheromone, signaling workers to build. But others can draw males to mate, trigger warlike reactions, or signal danger. Many scientists believe that learning this chemical language could provide man with a way to confuse insects so that they're unable to find mates or search for food, or perhaps even to make them fight themselves to extinction. How do you see the future? Will man always have to battle against insects no matter what new techniques he develops? My feeling is yes. That the only way in which we are going to uh, diminish the economic damage and health damage to ourselves as a, a species on the earth is for us to recognize that the, the insects were there before us. To, get a, to give one example, the termites were several uh, mil, hundreds of millions uh, highly developed, with a highly developed social system before man became biped and was walking the African continent. They are still with us. We have never ma still managed to control termites. And there's no reason why we should, be, should take it for granted that we have been, they will be completely under our thumb in, say, another thousand years from now. Living, not fighting with insects, may be wise strategy, for on balance they outweigh Earth's human population 12 to 1.